Hello and welcome to episode 56 of the Naked Eye podcast. This is Nathan Oxenfeld. And today I'm super excited to be joined by Dr. Jacob Lieberman today, who started off his career as an eye doctor, but since then has expanded into the fields of color therapy and light therapy and consciousness expansion. And he's the author of Light, Medicine of the Future, Take Off Your Glasses and See, Luminous Life, and also the inventor of the iPort vision training system and also the spectral receptivity system, which we're going to talk a little bit more about together today. So really happy to have you on the show today. Jacob, welcome to the show. Nathan, it's always good to see your smiling face. <laughs> oh, and one other thing I forgot to mention is that I was really excited to be uh, featuring you in our documentary last year, Vision 2020, From Eyesight to Insight. So if people haven't checked that out yet, that's also still available to see. It's an inspiring watch. But I did want to mention like my introduction to you. Um, it, it actually was about 10 years ago. I was I had just learned about natural vision improvement not too long before this. And I was at an ashram doing my yoga teacher training. Mm -hmm. And it was at Yogaville in Virginia. And I was just browsing through the bookstore. And since I was sort of aware of natural vision improvement, the spine of your book just kind of popped right out to my eyes and said, take off your glasses and see. And so that was like one of the very first books that I encountered about natural vision improvement. And it was just very foundational in my own personal vision journey. So obviously wanted to thank you for putting that out in the world. And, uh, sure. and that's made a huge difference in my life. And, and I'm sure people listening are familiar with you and your work, but if not, would you want to take a moment to kind of uh, introduce yourself before we, we dive in? Yeah, well, um, I was uh, traditionally trained as an optometrist or a behavioral optometrist. Um, I also uh, was awarded a PhD in vision science for some sort of pioneering work I did in the area of syntonics, which is the use of colored light by way of the eyes to create balance in the body. But my main focus from very early on has been something that you might say is beyond the term energy medicine. In fact, the term energy medicine may, may have first come out of my mouth uh, in 1989 when I opened up the Aspen Center for Energy Medicine. But when I say beyond energy medicine, um, people frequently confuse what we call consciousness with what we call mind. And energy medicine or mind-body medicine and so on has to do with mind. But based on my own direct experiences that I had in the 70s, uh, the initial one was using a vision training tool in 1971 for a couple minutes a day and going from a very average C student to a Dean's List student for two years straight uh, because when I did this vision training, literally a light went off inside. Mm. Something got triggered or turned on that literally changed the way I saw things, the way I responded to things, and my ability to perform, be present, and so on in my life. And then in 1976, my eyesight underwent a miraculous improvement that started out as some natural vision improvement techniques and lessening of eyeglass prescriptions and so on. Mm -hmm. But then the final leap was this instantaneous change in perception. You could say a, an insight, a revelation that I had, I saw something in a state of conscious, uh, in a state of meditation. And as Ralph Metzner once said, meditation is not what you think. 
and mm -hmm. something beyond. And so what occurred for me during this particular meditation in 1976 is that I realized that the source of our seeing was not our eyes and was not what we call the mind. And so when I say it's beyond energy medicine and beyond mind-body medicine, mm -hmm. I've really been searching for what is the source of the seeing. The spiritual traditions refer to that as who am I? Right. Who, who am I? And so life has taken me from a clinician and scientist to someone who is really interested in um, the inner workings of life. And why I feel this is uh, critical to our conversation is that when you look at the medical literature today, you, you learn that approximately 90% of what we call disease is either directly caused by or contributed to by something we call stress. Now, yeah. people have different ideas of what stress is, but you know, sometimes they say, well, it's losing your job, it's losing your money, it's going through a divorce, it's moving, you know, all these different things. When I consider what stress is, from the perspective of my own direct life's experience and of the approximately 50,000 people I've had the pleasure of working with, I realize that stress is what we experience when we interact or uh, find that we have a, an aspect of life that we experience that we have an allergic reaction to. When we encounter something in life that we don't know how to ingest, digest, assimilate, or excrete, mm -hmm. we have some reaction to it and the body lodges that information in some form in our body and sequesters it deeply so it does not interfere with our daily life. And it only comes to surface again when the time is right for us to see something differently. They, uh, this is not a problem. This is a fact of the miraculous intelligence of the workings of our life, which is a microcosm of the workings of this universe. So for me, I've been looking at what are the experiences that human beings have that cause them to, um, to constrict? Right. Sort of like when a child sees something that frightens them, for instance, they cover their eyes. They don't want to see it. And then if you look at a child, not only does it cover its eyes, but it brings its knees up to its chest. It yeah, everything kind of tightens. and Everything tightens. And then they start looking through their fingers right. so that whatever they take in is not so much that it's going to overwhelm them. Mm -hmm. And these are the behaviors of a highly intelligent system. Since 90% of our diseases are caused by or significantly contributed to by stress, and stress is really a situation where reality doesn't match mentality, our ideas of life does not match what's actually occurring in life, then you start looking at those psycho-emotional aspects of constriction, which is another word or another expression of why people become myopic. There's a constriction in their perceptual mechanism. Then you realize that vision improvement 
is not only about um, coming into a state of flow, uh, slowing things down, coming into a state of balance, coming into a place where the seeing is occurring versus the looking. In other words, it's effortless. It's not so much what I'm looking for, it's what's looking for me, what's catching my eye. So when I began looking at that, I started realizing that traumas, um, even small events that may have felt traumatic as a child can impact all these things. I'll, I'll give you a, a very simple example. You know that much of my work today, aside from public speaking and things like that, is that I work with a small number of individuals that I mentor. Right. And one of my clients right now, uh, who came to me and never ever mentioned that she wore glasses or anything like that. And so we were just looking at what came up in the course of our interactions. In other words, as our friendship flourished, more came to the surface and you could say more light was able to um, illuminate what was going on. Mm. And about a week ago, during our last session, this person said something profound. She had been working with this uh, spectral receptivity kit that I created, which is essentially a, a kit with 13 pairs of glasses. Each one of them has filters that allow only a certain portion of the light spectrum in, which we perceive as color but essentially it's only allowing in a certain portion of the vibrational frequencies of light. Mm -hmm. And she said to me, when I put on the ruby, all of a sudden darkness came into the space. Mm -hmm. And she was talking about how all kinds of things were going on physiologically for her, not just emotionally. And she said that happened during a weekend and on Sunday I had to go to a wedding. And I found that when I got to the wedding, I realized I had not put on my glasses or my contacts. Mm. And everything was crystal clear. Wow. And we had our session early in the week. And while we were on our Zoom call, I emailed her a link for an online eye chart right which is designed to see from 10 feet away so she put it on her 15 inch monitor which is really too small mm -hmm. and i asked her to measure off 10 feet then i she opened it up she went back to the 10 foot mark and she read 2020 after she read 2020 with each eye individually and both eyes together I said, what was your prescription? Because uh -huh. I, did, I didn't even know that she wore glasses. And her prescription would indicate that she should not be seeing really much better than 2200, one row beneath the biggest E on the chart. Yeah. Now, that occurred without doing anything without doing any vision exercises, without doing anything, but literally unlocking something that was keeping an aspect of her life constricted. Mm, that's huge. So what's magnificent about that is that we get caught up in doing things, techniques and so on, which are all very valuable. And we forget that most of the healing in our life doesn't occur during our waking hours. It occurs while we're sleeping. Right. It occurs when something in, isn't interfering because we have so much going on. And so 
I think this is a beautiful aspect of vision improvement that does not replace, but complements. It complements that which we are attempting to do. We're really asking the person not to see better, but to allow what's naturally there to just surface to allow the natural process of I see, which means I understand, to occur. And so the, the psycho-emotional aspects of our life are inseparable from the mechanisms of our physiology. They just work hand in hand. And so I have found this to be a lovely aspect of whatever I'm doing when I'm helping someone to hopefully retrieve their natural vision. Oh, wow. That's beautiful. And, and I can't wait to learn a little bit more about the, the different filters and the, and the effects and things. I, I did want to just share that through your book was one of the first introductions I had to that emotional connection, the psychological connection because I had been aware of some of the techniques, like you said, I was trying some of the Bates method, swinging and sunning and palming and starting to begin the process. But when I got to that section in your book about, you know, well, what, why, why are you myopic? Why, why did it develop when it developed and what was going on in your life that I really had to kind of close the book and put it down for a while because it led me down this very healing journey of going back to six years old, seven years old, eight years old, and really making these connections in my mind that I hadn't really connected before. So that that's just so huge. And, and I, I think what you're sharing today is probably could be one of the missing pieces or the, the elements that maybe people aren't incorporating and therefore aren't seeing kinds of, you know, the, the clarity, um, but I was in a session with a student this week who mentioned he was rereading your book, uh, Take Off Your Glasses and See, and was getting back to the open focus section where you kind of relax into your full visual field and enjoying your periphery and everything. And then it almost kind of makes you more susceptible for things to catch your eye. And he, right. he described it in the way that you said exactly. He said, the, the way I, I can describe this, he's a student in the Netherlands, he said, the best way I can describe what I've been doing is nothing. Right. And, and I feel like that is a really important kind of revel revelation to make is like, Oh, wow. It's, it's actually about letting go and relaxing and, and allowing and trusting that the changes happen while you're asleep, I think requires a little bit of trust <laughs> and faith, especially if we're kind of wired to like work so hard and put a lot of effort into it. And then actually, you're saying, actually, why don't you take a nap, <laughs> take a break, well, take a rest. Let's, let's look at that uh, in a slightly different way. Yeah. One of the most exciting, miraculous, and totally publicizing aspect of science is called the placebo effect, which is that you do a study on a pharmaceutical agent, for instance, and you find that uh, a, you know, a certain number of people get the expected effect from taking the pharmaceutical agent, and you get almost an equal number of people who get a significant effect from taking nothing. Mm -hmm. Well, when you look at the workings of this universe, you realize that there's no one in the sky moving the planets around the sun. This is all happening without any doing, without any work. Um, the workings of this universe, which is expressed microcosmically in the workings of our body, defines the word economy. Economy means you put in zero, you get back 100%. It's an effortless process. That is, in fact, the way we are designed to function. And that is the brilliance of Bates, 
Bates was talking about this process you call letting go, except letting go is not something you can do with the mind. Mm. The hand is designed to grab. It's not designed to do this. It grabs. That's what it's designed for. So Bates had people close their eyes in sun. Very relaxing. He had people swinging and not holding the world as it's swing, but allowing the world to move on its own while we're moving back and forth. Palming. Ah. And then he spoke about achieving blackness. Blackness is absolutely nothingness. There's no doing in that state of blackness. And so open focus was a, an open-eyed expression of what Bates was speaking about as blackness. Why was I expressing it as an open-eyed expression? Because the ultimate meditation is not so much sitting down with your eyes closed for 20 minutes. The purpose of meditation is to eventually become a living example of meditation which means the meditation is happening while you're washing the dishes, while you're driving your car, and so on. Mm -hmm. So you had said something. You said you, you, you were interested in discussing the different effects, and I thought you were alluding to the different filters, the different color filters. So yeah. let me say something about that. One of the things that we notice pretty routinely is um, we assign uh, an effect mm. to something. It does this. And it's sort of like saying, well, what's the effect of an apple? <laughs> oh, well, it has vitamin so and this and that and so on. So if 10 of us eat an apple, do we all receive that effect? No, mm -hmm. some don't get it at all. Yeah. Some get it to different amounts. So there's nothing intrinsically, there's no intrinsic value to anything. It is in the context of relationship, how I relate to whatever that is that determines what's going on for me. Mm -hmm. And so... You know, one person um, sees something and has a, a very strong effect to it. Another person sees exactly the same thing and has no effect at all. As sure. an example, I uh, was at a coffee shop a few months ago. I ran into some people that I knew. One of them is a physician and uh, somewhere in the conversation, she made a comment that she was against the use of the vaccine for COVID. And she said, well, what do you think of the vaccine? And I said, I don't really think about it. <laughs> and she said, uh, well, you wouldn't take it, would you? And I, I said, well, as a matter of fact, I did. Really, why would you do such a thing? I said, because I was just guided to do that. And she says, oh, I, I can't understand that. So I said, she was sitting with her husband. And I said to her, do you remember when you fell in love with him? She said, of course. Was there anything you could do about it? She said, no, just it was a big feeling. I said, well, let's imagine you called your 10 closest girlfriends today and they were sitting here next to us and they were all gazing upon your lovely husband. Do you think they'd all fall in love with him? And she said, of course not. I said, well, which one of them is right and which one is wrong? And all of a sudden, she got it, that each of us has a GPS that guides us one way or the other. And so what I'm, in fact, sharing is that I took the visible spectrum, what we call light. Mm -hmm. And I separated it out 
into portions and then got filters that literally just allowed that part of life to come in. When I say that part of life, that part of the light spectrum, which is the energetic foundation of what we call our experiences. And so I don't put any value or any meaning on any of the filters. I let the person tell me what the meaning is for them because that's all that's important. And so the process of using the color filters is about noticing, just noticing, noticing what happens. And you know, when we encounter some event that's a little difficult to embrace, mm -hmm. one of the first things that occurs, and you see this in the vision improvement field all the time, is that the breathing mechanism constricts or temporarily comes to a halt. Right. And the breathing mechanism, again, is a microcosmic expression of this, what I call the frequency of wellness in the universe. It's this. It's this continual movement of expansion and contraction. Uh, in the East, they refer to it as yin and yang. But what we know is we see this in all living things. The universe, the solar system, a tree, the earth itself, continually expanding and contracting. And that particular cycle or rhythm is entrained into the physiology. Yeah. We don't realize how enormous this is. And so we just say, oh, I'm breathing. Right. No, no, I'm not breathing. Something is breathing, expanding, and contracting mm -hmm. us. Because this is such a foundational rhythm, and I noticed very early in the 70s, every time we think, we hold a breath. Mm -hmm. Every time we try, we hold the breath. Every time we do, we hold the breath. When is the breath not being held is when life is living us. When something is moving us effortlessly and not being guided by ideas. Why is that so crucial? Today, when something isn't working in life, people say, oh, that's just your belief system. You need to change your beliefs. But if you look up the word belief, you see that belief means the opposite of truth. Mm. So our beliefs are not truth. And truth is that thing that sets one free. So what we're looking for is, is the truth beyond all of the opinions that fill our life. And the mind is just an archive of opinion. That which is the source of the seeing, that which notices the chatter in the mind, that has no opinions, that has no point of view, that merely just has the direct experience of seeing, which is what occurs when your, your patient says, oh my God, I just had a flash of clarity. That flash, which happens when one least expects it and right. always occurs at no charge, no doing, no working at it, that's the placebo. That's what we're looking for in this whole thing. So helping someone to notice what causes their system to constrict, mm -hmm. just seeing that becomes a curative part of the process. See, I like living life without homework. For me, it's not about all the doing things, and it's not about understanding. It's about something beyond that. It's about just being comfortable with something that used to feel uncomfortable.
And so when we, when I work with color and I allow someone to work through a protocol that I have developed over many years of working with thousands of people, I don't say, okay, put on this filter for 10 minutes. Right. Where the hell did 10 minutes come from? It could take a microsecond. Uh -huh. So what I do is I have the person, let's imagine we start with the red end of the spectrum and they put on a ruby pair of glasses, having them sit outside and put it on. And the first thing they notice is, how does it feel? Mm -hmm. And believe me, you know it immediately. There's nothing to think about. There's a knowing without any thinking or worrying whatsoever. And one of the first things that I share with someone, let's say with the Ruby filter, is you, you can take in anywhere from one to five breaths, just mm -hmm. depending on, or a half a breath. Mm -hmm. Right. So if the person knows, notices that their breathing is constricted, they immediately take them off. Yeah. Why do they take them off? Because the moment it constricts, the body's telling you that's enough. Yeah. Not stop. It's saying that's as much as I need. That's as much as I can take in this moment. And so we don't want to overwhelm any more than when you did your yoga teacher training at Yogaville, you know, they wouldn't put you in a posture and stretch till you pull the muscle. No. The idea is to only be there as long as the breathing is in a state of flow. So the, the moment the person notices any change in that, that says, thank you, I've had enough. I see. And if, if you did it longer, you'd get indigestion. It's like right. eating too much. Uh -huh. So what we're looking for is the just noticeable difference. What's the... The first instance that you notice, uh, thank you. You take it off and then maybe they'll go to the next filter. And the protocols that I use, usually just two filters a day. And it's only for a matter of seconds. It's not repetition that right. creates the fact. It's awareness that is curative. So... Gradually, we allow the person to get more comfortable with eating the spinach that they thought was not going to be very delicious. Right. And, and so they gradually become more comfortable with a vibrational aspect of life that used to feel uncomfortable. When you encounter something in life that you have an allergic reaction to, could be an ex-lover, could be someone that you felt betrayed you, could be someone that reminds you of your father or mother that was a certain way. And their mere presence creates a vibrational signal. That vibrational signal either resonates or doesn't resonate with something within us. Mm -hmm. And so when there's resonance, you will feel inside something is beginning to get uh, perturbed slightly. The idea is not to keep it together, to move through it, mm -hmm. just do it. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with something saying to you, something is not right. When an animal experiences this, it doesn't wait for the crocodile to jump out of the water. It backs away and frequently it takes off because it knows something is not comfortable. Yeah. So this is about listening to that inner knowing that knows without thinking. This is what our teachers used to say when they said, your first impression is always correct. Uh -huh. That's what we know by heart. So vision improvement is all about noticing what is noticed by that um, 
aspect of our humanity that is indescribable, but is always there. You know, when you wake up sometimes at night or in the morning and you said, wow, I, I had this amazing dream. How did you know that you had an amazing dream? <laughs> the way that you knew is because there's an aspect of our humanity that never sleeps. Right. And that's the eyes. I call them the eyes of God. That's the field of awareness that is always aware. And that is aware of all the physiological activity. That is aware of the external world. And that is very aware of the inner chatter that we call thinking, which is actually worrying. And so it is aware of this process within us that has evolved over tens of millions of years that includes not only all the conditioning that this human uh, being has had, but all of the compensations associated with each conditioning. And so the conditioning is not didn't begin when you were born. It began at the beginning of time when those that you call your ancestors began to evolve. You, I am the current state of that awareness right now. And so everything that's preceded in us is somewhere in there and the mind is aware of certain aspects of it. And so when we realize that we are not the mind, we are that which is noticing the mind, that shift is dramatic. Yeah. That's when the seeing occurs. Yeah, it's it's very inspiring because it it really kind of gets you in touch with this this power and inner knowing. It kind of reminds me of that mantra of I'm not the body, I'm not the mind, immortal self I am. Right. You know, and it you know kind of like you said, we're not seeing from the eyes, we're not seeing from just the mind. It's it's coming from this this deeper place and um especially if we're struggling with our eyesight or having vision issues that can really be disempowering and we're kind of seeking outside help and, and looking out. And I'm really appreciative that you're pointing us back within and really knowing that, that the answers are in there and the, the intelligence is in there and, and it's like accessible. Uh, it's, maybe it's a very, it's a very difficult thing to see because yeah. everything that we are and everything that we see is conditioned after something that is normal but totally unnatural. Yeah. So, for instance, as an example, we get into our cars to drive and we're always in drive or we're in reverse or we're in park. There's a gear we rarely, if ever, visit. It's called neutral. Yeah. Neutral is a state of optimal presence. It's in the middle. It's the place that can move in any direction as needed instantaneously. When Bates was speaking of blackness, what I am supporting the people I work with to begin to notice is that state of neutrality that sees everything without looking. It's incredibly powerful. And when it's really powerful is when it inhabits your life. And, you know, you've heard me probably mention this, this first verse of this piece called the Sin Sin Ming that was written 1600 years ago. But the words are so critical to what we're speaking about. I'd like to just recite it again. Yeah. So the author says, the great way is not difficult for those who have no preferences. What is the great way? The great way is what Jesus referred to as the kingdom of God. It's the enlightenment that people speak about. 
it's the middle, seeing from the middle. And what the author is saying is, this is, this is what occurs when no preferences exist, when I'm not for it and I'm not against it. Then they go on to say, when love and hate are both absent, everything is clear and undisguised. They're giving it to you. They're feeding it to you simply. Eliminate the for and against, and everything is clear. Not only clear optically, but that's the moment of I see, I know. It's not I understand, it's a knowing. And then it says, make the slightest distinction, however, and heaven and earth are set infinitely apart. The moment that you take a side, that you have an opinion, <clears throat> it's lost. Yeah. That's why Bates was speaking about palming. Mm -hmm. He was taking away the visual things in life that we say, oh, I like that, but I don't like that. Yeah. And blackness was the ultimate state of non-discernibility. Cannot see any for or against. So these are really, really critical pieces that were seen through direct experience by the ancient mystics. And now we're even beginning to see this in modern science. Mm. You know, the field of mind-body medicine, uh, one of the pioneers was a woman who was a dear friend of mine who passed away years ago named Candace Pert. Candace Pert was the author of a wonderful book, Molecules of Emotion. Oh, yeah. And what she was discussing was her groundbreaking work of realizing that when there's a thought, an idea, a belief that we identify with, my idea, then there's an instantaneous materialization of that non-physical thought into a function of the body. Our body becomes a living representation of this formless thing we call a thought. Candace and I met sometime in the early 80s when I was speaking at a international psychology conference mm -hmm. in Washington, D.C. And as I spoke, she stood up and she was sharing about her work, about how a state of mind is reflected in a state of biology. And I said to her, well, what happens when there's no point of view? Mm. That question is what ended up in a very long friendship. <laughs> because everyone is looking at state of mind. Mm -hmm. The real shift happens when there's a state of no mind. When what we call mind might be functioning, but what is seeing is not seeing through the beliefs, it's having a direct experience. Mm. And it's, I guess another, that's sort of another interpretation of filters, not the color filters, yes. these certain like mental right. filters or beliefs that, you know, come along the way and, and may actually change our perception of the not light. May. That's coming in. Absolutely yeah. change, absolutely change the perception. And because we've been indoctrinated to believe that what makes me a human being more evolved than the animals and the trees, which is absolutely not true, is that I have a mind mm -hmm. and I can think. How many people have actually questioned this and said, is this true? Mm. How many people are speaking, uh, looking at what we call thinking and realizing that it's almost always worrying? It's what we do to try to make things go our way so that we are not disturbed by the 
perturbance of life, which is the agitation that causes a quantum leap in our evolution. In other words, we keep trying to keep that which is constant still. And maybe the most important discussion to have, which is to look at our current way of looking at this mechanism we call mind, we must ask some real questions. Is this really true? Do we actually learn through the mind? Is thinking required for learning or does thinking actually interfere with the process of effortless learning? These are things I've been looking at for many, many years. You know, the people you know well, like Ray Gottlieb and, and Larry Wallace, we were all looking at these things in the early 70s, really crucial, important pieces of not only how to see clearly, but how to live a content life. Yeah, I love that. And I agree that these are the important conversations to be having and questions to ask, you know, and, and really get to the heart of it and, and really connect in. <clears throat> Yeah. One, I guess, little revelation I've had lately about color in general is that you always hear about things like Sanskrit being a vibrational language. Right. And I just sort of was starting to think of the colors as these vibrational language that just go beyond any kind of verbal explanation. And it, it, like you said earlier, it's this feeling and, and the noticing, I think, is the one of the key pieces. And I as I've been going through doing this, these better eyesight podcasts and, and combing through all of Dr. Bates's original publications a hundred years ago, that's something that keeps showing up is that whether people back then were more attuned to it or Bates and his team was very, very skilled at helping people get into that, but people are noticing really subtle things about themselves and about their vision when they're in Bates's clinic Absolutely. And, and, and I feel like, you know, maybe when I first was reading through your book or, or trying to cram all this information in, like I was just, you know, absorbing a lot and I wasn't really noticing those subtle things at first. Um, Cause I was just so excited to be like, you know, learning all this stuff, but that, that's a really good reminder to really get, get really tuned into the subtle signals and, and information that we can get, whether it's, using color therapy or even just doing the sunning from Bates method or any Bates practice, anything in life, really just kind of tuning into those. All inner, of life, all yeah. of life is an energetic or vibrational experience, which essentially means that everything, when you take it down to its foundational level is just different levels of vibration. Color does not exist except in one's perception, except in one's awareness. There's no color in the world. It's just that when that vibration interacts with our perceptual mechanisms, and that's different for each species, yeah. that creature has an experience. Our experience of that vibration, we call it color. There is no color out there. <clears throat> There's just vibration that right. interacts with the visual perceptual mechanism of a human being. And then when it goes through all the mental filters and something called consciousness or awareness, which people have yet to define, we have this experience. So the purpose of using different filters is not to deal with the everyday experiences of life, but to deal with the subtlest of vibration, which is the foundation of those experiences. Mm -hmm. For instance, if you had a traumatic event and we were in therapy together, and I said, um, well, tell me about that. And you say, oh, God, I don't want to discuss it. That was an awful time of my life. 
And yet, let's imagine I have you look in momentarily through a specific filter, and that filter, through a means of resonance, awakens the feeling by slipping beneath conscious awareness. Yeah. That's what the power is, is that you don't have to go through 20 years of discussion. Right. You can get very near the heart of it in a very gentle way that respects the sanctity of the person and does not overwhelm them mm. and helps them to gradually be able to embrace every aspect of their life and to see it not as good or bad, mm. but to see it from a choiceless place. That's such a, a practical thing that, that you've given us is like, if I can find more equanimity or neutrality with the full spectrum of colors, I know that that will translate into everything from right. there. Right. And what an amazing entry point into that. Wow. <laughs> and I love how so much of what you've been sharing today is, is based off of one of my favorite concepts of biomimicry, just kind of basing off of nature and studying how natural cycles and rhythms work and getting into alignment with that. And I was, I was struck by your, your newer book, Luminous Life, talking about these migrations of, of animals around the world and how there's just this, you know, following the light, you're sort of inviting or opening readers up to learn how to follow the light themselves and, and really tune into that, um, like that feeling you said that just guides you. And, and I guess a question around that is, and it might be to do with the colors or, um, but what, what do you feel like if people feel like that they're either not in touch with that light or, I mean, it might just be more kind of in, in the head, but like, yeah, do you, do you have any little strategies to help people really kind of tune into that or, or maybe move more in that direction of that sort of effortlessness? So let's go back. You talked about, you said something mimicry. Oh yeah, biomimicry. Right. And my interpretation of what you're sa saying is that we're mimicking nature. But you understand that we are not the observers of nature. We are nature. Yeah. We are just like a tree. And our makeup, just like a tree, is part of nature. So there is no way for you to escape the fact that we are natural beings. A lot of the problems we experience are because we've lost sight of this source of our seeing and we are looking at life through ideas. That's why I said mentality does not match reality. Our right. ideas do not match what's going on. You cannot escape the light. You've got a hundred trillion cells that are all being guided by light throughout the day and throughout the night. At night, it is more subtle because the light is reflected light from the moon, light from the stars, and so on. But you cannot escape it. And that is occurring without any awareness on your part. Light is invisible. We experience brightness, but nobody sees light. Light is the formless essence that becomes what we call life. And so our cells are continually being guided by information that is carried in light that tells the cell what time of the day is it? What time of the year is it? Are you on the East Coast in Vermont? Or are you in Maui, Hawaii? Or are you in Perth, Australia? Because that sets up the rhythms of your body when you eat, when you sleep, 
when you have to go to the bathroom, when you get hungry, when your hormones release, every aspect of your physiology is inseparable from your circadian rhythms. Those are the rhythms that cycle around day and night. And in fact, the Nobel Prize in 2017 was won by three US scientists that discovered the molecular mechanism by which humans, plants, and animals stay well. Hmm. Their health stays well because they're synchronized with mother nature, which is exactly the mimicry that you're speaking about. So what is there to do? Nothing, nothing, nada. The thing is to notice, to notice what's happening that causes the breathing to constrict, the musculature to tighten, that causes us to go to sleep at three in the morning when we start yawning at 9.30. The whole process of transformation or resynchronization with Mother Nature is the process of noticing. Once you see it, everything changes. There's nothing to do. That's just part of this model. Oh, you do it over and over again, and that's the way you get it. I go to the gym, I do biceps, my muscles grow. <clears throat> terrific, until I stop using, doing the exercises, which we all stop after a while. Mm -hmm. What we're looking for is the level of transformation that requires no practice. Mm -hmm. It is who we are. So Luminous Life was introducing to the public the scientific basis for the fact that we're all guided all the time. Mm, yeah. I know this is going to sound crazy, but there's nothing to think about. There's nothing to think about. All of us, so many people practice meditation. Why? It's, it's, we reduce stress, we feel better, we live longer, all of that. That's what we want in our lives. Meditation is not an idea. Meditation is not the thought process. Meditation is the point where you notice the thought process functioning and in the noticing, you realize that you are not the thought process, but the observer. So it's the awareness is what's curative. Our work as teachers of vision improvement is about helping people to recognize who they are. What is the source of the seeing? In other words, what is it that's guiding them? And then you begin to realize that, you know, I'm looking out my window right now. I live in a eucalyptus forest. These eucalyptus trees that I'm looking at now some of them have been here a hundred years. I'm sure if they meditated in an ashram every day, if they became vegans, if they did all the right things, yeah? I don't think they could ever look like a palm tree or ever create apples. They're not designed for that. Each of us has a nature. Your nature is to inspire. That is your nature. You have always been led by inspiration. That's what your smile is. Your smile is a barometer of your level of excitement and inspiration. This is why you are involved in the work that you do. You're not there because, oh, you're going to become a millionaire. Make No, you're there because you must be there. Yeah. That's what I'm sharing. I, I didn't agree to do this this interview with you today because oh Nathan offered me a lot of money oh this is going to put me on the New York Times bestseller list who cares about that what's exciting is the fire we're feeling right now 
And that's the fire that you're sharing with everyone that comes into your life, whether they come to your clinic and work with you, or whether you're sitting at a restaurant and you share that with the lovely server that's bringing you your tea. That's how things occur in the world. Your inspiration becomes contagious. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it all makes sense. And it's, it's an amazing reminder to hear how the answer is already there. And right. it's just a matter of listening and tuning in. Even if you don't listen and you don't tune in, it comes out any, you yeah. know, I had no idea what we were going to speak about today. Neither did you. You, yeah. you, you said it. I know your style. <laughs> yeah. But you see, it's not my style. It's the style of nature. Right. Everything is just what they is. And so it just comes out. People wonder, gee, how do you get in, up in front of an audience and speak without any preparation? The secret is I'm not speaking. Something is moving through me that that's the intelligence. I'm merely the post, the postal guy delivering the mail. Yeah. So the, the process of experience, this miraculous thing that is otherwise known as vision improvement um, is that it humbles us. The self-important of life dissolves and what you're left with is a sense of knowing of, oh, thank God I'm home. You know, that, that this wonderful thing has visited my life. Absolutely. And, and I'm, I'm feeling, I'm feeling the fire. <laughs> it's just like, yeah. feels so good. Good to be here with you and, and going through this and the feeling is mutual. Yeah. And before our talk today, I was, I was more familiar with your iPort vision training system of kind of working with the fusion work and, and working on the eye teaming and binocular vision. And so I was really, really excited to fill out this other approach you've got with the color filters, the spectral re, uh, receptivity system. I, I did have one little question about it. If somebody's just like gets a pair of like yellow glasses at a drugstore or finds, cause you can find these, you know, colored lenses all over the place. Like would that have a similar sort of thing or would the, are the filters that you have like really specific? They're different. Yeah. They're different. The filters that I use are the distillation of many years of work. When I was working with Syntonics, they have a certain set of filters. But when I started creating my own light therapy units, see, I, I was one of the first people to have the Syntonic filters spectrographically analyzed. Mm -hmm. And I began to see that sometimes the filter didn't match up what the definition or what the description of the filter was. So I designed my filters in a different way. Initially, through a device I, I call the color receptivity trainer, then the spectral receptivity system one, two, and now three. Mm -hmm. uh, each one has been a further distillation of the filter system and how to apply it. Uh, the current system is not a device that, you know, at that time was $4,500. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a home unit that is affordable and in many ways uh, more efficacious because my what I've seen over the years from working with many people and people providing feedback of them using it with their clients is that it, it continues to refine more and more. And with that refinement, it becomes even more subtle and more potent. Mm. So those filters that you see in the store, they look a certain color, but 
the wavelengths are going to be very different. Yeah. Yeah, that's but what they I figured. Will, they will have some effect, but um, the approach that I use is what's very, very different. Totally, totally. Yeah, because like it, it's not just putting them on. It's like right. the whole protocol right. around it and, <laughs> you know, the, yeah. the information. Yeah. So, yeah. And would, would you say that like your website is the best place for people to learn more about that? Yeah, sure. They can go to the website. Uh, that's where they're available. Um, my website is more of an educational site than a marketing site. I, I'm not that yeah. interested in selling stuff. Um, what's exciting for me is this kind of conversation. Yeah, no, I love I love all the, the videos and resources and um, other interviews you've put out in, in the past. And even just short little clips always seem to... Uh, get me get me into the zone so to speak and so to be able to be with you today for so long has been been a pleasure and you know like I said in my own story since since you're a character who played a role in in sort of the genesis of my burgeoning vision journey um, it's just been really really uh, special to to speak with you today and and bring it all around and it's been great to uh, go through this journey together I always feel the same way when I connect with you. Look, you are the current state of Bates, of Lieberman, of Gottlieb, of Kaplan, of Wallace, all the people that each of us made a little contribution to this. You and your colleagues are carrying this forth. Our responsibility is to give you everything we have. So to make your journey as easy and as refined and as wonderful as it can be. Thank you so much. Yeah, it, it, you, you've already begun that in many ways. And, and even today in our conversation, the wheels were turning and, and new insights were being had. And, and I can only imagine uh, the same happening for, for those listening to our conversation today too. So, And remember, if Bates was living today, he would not be talking about what he was doing a hundred years ago. Right. Bates is living today in you and all of the others that are doing the work that you're doing. Have a grateful day. Thank you so much, Jacob. Wonderful to speak with you today. All right. Thank you to everyone we'll see listening. You soon. All right. Bye bye.